Welcome to Media Path. I am Louise Planker, and Fritz Coleman currently is on the phone with Spectrum. So hopefully they're recording him and it will be like their most excellent podcast ever because we don't have Fritz with us and we're jealous of Spectrum. So, uh, you know, we know that your curated media path is rich and full, but does it include the Leslie and Lisa show now appearing on YouTube? Coming up on our show from the Leslie and Lisa show will be the title characters, Leslie and Lisa. But first, I was going to ask Fritz, where has your media path taken you this week? Apparently on the phone with Spectrum. So we're moving on to my media path picks. And this week, I have been obsessively watching a, I think it's an HBO show, but I'm watching it on Amazon, called The Vow. It's a docu-series from Juhin Nujam and Kareem Amir. Pardon me if I did not get the pronunciations correct. But you can read them on the internet and then do the own pronunciation that comes up in your own head. It's kind of like choose your own adventure with these spellings. So the vow tracks the experiences of folks who were deeply involved in the self-improvement group Nexium, an organization which was ultimately the target of a series of criminal charges, including sex trafficking and racketeering conspiracy, which were brought against its highest members, including founder Keith Raniere. Here's the thing about cults. They are like a really attractive psychopath. You just get intoxicated. And let's say it starts with self-improvement seminars. Much of what you are learning is truly helpful and you feel renewed and awakened and invigorated and you just keep chasing that high. And now you are in with a group of like-minded people who are all seeking to improve themselves and find meaning and purpose and enlightenment and to share their realizations with others. And cults attract and entrap really excellent people. But very soon, the cult becomes everything you believe and everyone you know. This particular group, Nexium, first of all, they are horrible spellers because Nexium is spelled N-X-I-V-M. They brand themselves as a multi-level marketing organization that offers personal and professional development seminars within which they house a secret society called DOS which was a low-key sex cult. Women were selected and invited after attending some confidential Nexium seminars. Their initiation included branding their vagina with a mountain and a river, which is actually when you tip yourself sideways, the initials of cult leader, genius, guru, freak, Keith Raniere, who had sex with his slaves and urged women to follow near starvation diets to achieve the type of physique he found appealing. P.S. The guy himself was kind of pudgy. This is all designed to empower women by forcing them to push through their fear of having their vagina branded. I say watch it and you're going to see some parallels between any cult, whether it's Scientology or this one, and people who are currently under the spell of Donald J. Trump. There is a lot of like eerie parallels. And I want you two to watch it, Leslie and Lisa, and then you'll come back on the show and we'll discuss because you two will be I've already upset. seen it. I already saw it. Oh, all right. Are you ready to speak? Yeah. Okay, wait. But I, of course, I know all about it and I've heard a lot about it, but are you going to talk about anything that's going to like give it away? No, or because I haven't did. finished it. I haven't finished it last. By the way, by the way, I'm the kind of girl that even if you told me the ending, like obvious, I would still watch it anyway. So go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm not done with it. I'm just kind of currently ensnared in it. Like this is my cult watching the show. So if anyone has any opinions about just cults in general, and we don't have to give away any specifics about this show other than the vagina branding, which I can't stop thinking about. I watched the whole thing. I've seen the whole thing. So do do you, let's talk about the psychology of it. So my husband and I watched this together. And the thing is, there are so many people who were a part of it who then um, broke away who are smart, normal people. Uh, they're hmm. just normal friggin' moms and dads and, and husbands and wives. And, and uh, they're, they were so sucked in by this man I mean, but it's like, there's, there's a ton of episodes where you just see them listening to him talk as if he's Jesus. They're just, you know, oh, just everything, everything that comes out of his mouth, uh, they act like it's just, you know, pure gold dripping over them. And then the way he speaks and manipulates and turns things around it's it is it's fascinating because what you said is exactly right it attracts smart people and then it ensnares them 
um, without them realizing it. It happened so slowly. These people, it happened to over like 14 years, some of them. Right. And this one is like especially insidious because it wasn't kind of like portrayed as even a religion. And a lot of cults it, it, in the beginning, you go, oh, I'm going to go to some meetings about this new way of like thinking and believing why we're here. This and one is really self. Yeah. This one is like self-improvement and how to empower yourself. And, you know, like it, it's not doesn't present itself as any sort of faith based anything. It's just like, oh, these are seminars. Like, it's like not that far removed from a Tony Robbins or just a seminar that you'd go to for the weekend. Right. And maybe you'd bake in a hot tent and die. But if you didn't, you'd feel really good about yourself afterwards. Right. It's so kind of crazy because I can only think of it from my personal perspective, which is I think to myself, I am far too smart and uh, cynical to ever think that I could be sucked in by someone like this. But I will say, you think about all the, all the cult leaders, even like a Charlie Manson, they're brilliant, sick, yes, brilliant. That's right? it. That is it. And they know how to use their, their uh, genius for ill. They're not I using, they're not using their powers for good. They're using their powers to control and manipulate people. I also think they are what these people are best at is finding what your particular weakness is um, yeah. and then making you think that they can help you with that. And then yeah. once that starts, then he starts saying, okay, well now you really got to stop sleeping so, so many hours per night. It's mm -hmm. not doing you any favors. You'll be so much more productive if you only sleep six or five hours a night. And then you're really eating too many calories and that's going to make you sluggish and you're never going to achieve your goals. So you have to, and then once you're starving and sleep deprived, then you're going to believe even more. Right. You become even more vulnerable. And what happens is the actual tools that they use, like let's say it's Scientology and they use, I forget what they call it, where you hold the paddles, but they find out what it is you need to work on. So now sure. they have stuff on you right. and then they use it against you. Yes. So, and they do the exact same thing in, in Nexium that they do in Scientology, which is exactly what you just said. They get you to tell secrets, even if they're lies. Right. Um, so that if they're ever played for those people you lied or told the truth about your life is destroyed. So now they have right. collateral. Yeah. And it's not just your own personal weaknesses that you're working on. It's the ones that they create. So in the DOS cult, they would have all of the women take naked photos and send them and then make a videotape where they say horrible things about people they love, like their right. family members. And then they would send that. So they held on to all this compromise about everybody. And that way they hoped that nobody would um, squawk. But then eventually... All it takes is really one person hitting bottom, and then that gives a lot of other people the courage right. to to leave. And but it was it's very harrowing. And so this is like I think anytime we're focused, we're too focused on one person and not ourselves, and not what 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 is balance. Like if we're too focused on one charismatic person, I think we have to ask ourselves like, is this real or am I just being hypnotized. You're so right, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> so the second thing I wanted to talk about is a documentary that you guys have to watch because it's like completely delicious. It's called Booksellers. And I was in like right from the get-go because I love completely quirky people. That's my yes. favorite. So this one is um, about antique antiquarian booksellers and they are part scholar part detective and part business person and their personalities and knowledge are as broad as the material they handle they also play in an underappreciated yet essential role in preserving history the booksellers takes viewers inside their small but fascinating world populated by an assortment of obsessives intellects eccentrics and dreamers executive produced by parker posey the film features interviews with some of the most important dealers in the business as well as prominent collectors auctioneers and writers such as fran Leibowitz, susan orlean kevin young and gay talise both a loving celebration of book culture and a serious exploration of the future of the book. The film also examines technology's impact on the trade, the importance of books as physical objects, the decline of used and rare bookstores, collecting obsessions, and the relentless hunt for the next great find. And I would like to request that Fran Leibowitz appear in every documentary from this moment forward because she's so brilliantly adorable and I could just watch her talk forever. She's adorable. Right? <laughs> and she just like, I was watching the movie by myself and laughing 
out loud at everything that she said. Um, there's an interesting point made in the film, which I wanted to talk about with you guys, which is that although the ubiquity of the printed book in our homes is coming to the end of its 550 year run, books will find a home somewhere because we humans are not inclined to throw away a book like ever. We sell them, leave them behind, donate them, put them down at the curb. But even people who don't read won't throw away a book. And I think it's because words collected and inscribed into a book are considered sacred by all humans. It would be like disposing of a planet. We may not know what's in there, but we know it has value to someone and it must be preserved. So I want to talk to you guys about your relationship with books. That's so interesting, Louise, by the way. You're right. It is so sacred. I mean, I have... I still have all of my Judy Bloom books mm -hmm. that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I have this one book. It was probably the raciest book, aside from some of the Judy Bloom books, um, that I read. Like the the most, like for a ten year old girl, it was like reading Anais Nin, probably. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I mean, I, I, now all of a sudden I'm going blank on. It was made into like an after school special too. Boy, I'm really dating myself, right? Remember ABC after school specials? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And, Anyways, and, and um, finding out that someone went all the way and oh having to gosh, ask somebody yeah. what that meant and yeah. where all the way is. And it's funny. I think I think now that I'm an adult, I think back that I kept all of these books thinking that I would give them to my children one day. I'm sure I couldn't be what I was thinking when I was 10, but I still have. Ev I mean, you're right. I have everything, every theater book, everything I've ever bought at Samuel French. It's all in my it's all either in books or in my book cabinet because you can't get rid of it no and doesn't it make you happy to walk by and just see the book yeah well uh, uh, the, the funny thing is that a reference about three months ago somebody sent me a cameo from rex smith who was a singer who was in this movie what and a thoughtful so, gift right and it was uh, uh, anyway so i went and uh i was like i still have this book <laughs> and i pulled it out of my and they were like why do you, I'm literally going, I want to say forever by Judy Bloom, but it's not that it's something else. But anyways, the fact that I pulled it out and of course it has me, my, uh, I, I, I tend to um, doodle. And so it's got my doodles all over it from when I was little anyways, but you're right. I will say though, with my children and their books, I, because I'm such a clean freak, I have purged and I take everything to the library. Yeah. You take and it I to the library. Everything. You took it well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It's one of the few things in the world that we literally will not throw away. Right. But I do have to say there are certain books for me that I pro I think I have um, given away that now it makes me sad. Like my son is reading The Outsiders in school and that oh. was one of my favorite books when I was his age. And so I wish he was reading my copy instead of one we got at the library. Um, and you know, there are, there are some books that I remember, like a tree grows in Brooklyn, yes. secret garden, um, the outsiders, uh, there's a book called pardon me, you're stepping on my eyeball that honestly, I don't even remember what it's about, but I remember sobbing reading it like under a blanket on the couch when I was 11 well, or 12. And because it, it hurts when, when someone steps on your eyeball, it's very, it, <laughs> It does. That doesn't. You know what I have? I. It's funny that you say that, Lise, because I have been able to, um, I guess, because I inadvertently kept all these books from when I was a kid. My daughter, I gave, my daughter has my copy of Where the Sidewalk Ends. Oh, wow. She also has, my mother bought me when I was, you know, I don't know, of when I was going through puberty, she bought me that book called What's Happening to Me. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it, by the way, that also has all my crazy doodles all over it, but I gave that to Izzy to read. Oh. You know, it's so 70s, what's happening to me. I it's very it. different from the puberty books of today. But I was like, take a look at this. This was the book that I was given when I was going through puberty. Oh, my God. That's so cute. I love I that. I will definitely keep all of the books that I read to Garrett. Like, I can't get rid of those. I mean, the, a, a core, like, 20 of them. I want to pass those on for sure. Ah, uh, I love that. So now I'm going to introduce you 
Oh, okay. Which I think will be helpful. <laughs> Leslie Boone and Lisa Arch have a talk show. As working actresses, moms, and longtime friends, they like to spend their time talking about the things that affect their lives and inviting interesting and sometimes famous people to join the party. Leslie and Lisa know famous people. Lisa Arch is an American actress and comedian known for her roles in the 1997 to 98 season of the Fox Network comedy show Mad TV as co-host of TBS's Diner and a Movie from 2002 to 2005 and is the recurring character of Samantha Samuels on Disney Channel's Corey in the House according to Wikipedia. Leslie Boone is an American producer and television actress best known for her roles as Marlene Gilbert on the Fox sitcom Babes, as Molly Hudson in the NBC comedy drama Ed, and as Rose Roberts in the ABC action-adventure show Agent Carter, included in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, according to Wikipedia. So I would love for you two to tell to me about- To update our Wikipedias? No, well, no, no. I had fun reading them. And it's hard to update Wikipedias. You have to ask someone else to do it. And there's like a mystery to it. Correct. Right. Okay, so wait, I have a Wikipedia story. And Lisa and I spoke about this recently. I said to her, I think one of our stock questions, um, at least to our celebrity friends, should be like, so is there anything on your Wiki page that like is not- for reals, like false, whatever. Um, it, and on my Wikipedia page and on my IMDb page, it actually says that I starred, or not the, rather starred, but that I was in Fences, which was an amazing movie with Denzel Washington. And um, all of a sudden I'm going blank, uh, Viola Davis. And I would like to think that I was in Fences and I'll take it. I have literally emailed people about it to say, this is not um, truth. I was not, I did not appear in this movie, but I'll take it. Um, it says that I played an evangelical preacher, but I did not. Were you in picket fences? Uh, nope. I was another, I, <laughs> the only thing I've, see, there it is. The only thing I've ever done is maybe, um, climb the fence. That's it. Okay. So well, but again, someone filmed it and you're. What a fantastic <laughs> credit to have on my IMDb page. Kudos. I love it. Kudos. And I would have preferred that you said that I was on Curb Your Enthusiasm as opposed to. Oh, well, we're going to get to that. I have oh, questions okay. specifically about that. All right. So, I, but first I want to, I want you two to talk about your, your new show and the pandemic and how you decided to, that this would be something good for you two to do together. You want to start, Les, or you want me to? Sure. I mean, listen, I, you know, I think like everyone, you found yourself uh, locked in roughly four walls. And what the heck are you going to do? Um, it's not like I was working like a crazy woman prior to the pandemic. But then all of a sudden you find yourself at home doing nothing. And we're all creative beings. And I was just kind of like climbing the walls, trying to figure out what I could do. And I started seeing a life coach in January and started talking about my dream of hosting a talk show for my entire life ever since I saw Oprah in 1986. Um, and so this was the time to, I mean, every other celebrity in the world was doing a talk show from their office and or bedroom. So I figured, why can't we? And so I called Lisa and was like, can't think of anybody better and funnier to do this with. Uh, what do you think? I, I mean, we threw around a bunch of stuff. Like, why don't we tape ourselves as the Real Housewives of Quarantine? Um, <laughs> Lisa was doing, you know, interviews that she can talk about. Um, so we just... We just figured, you know what, let's just throw all of this stuff up against the wall and see what sticks. And so there you have it. And I love that you are so organized in your show and that you have segments and low tech paddle boards to announce them. So talk about your segments and talk about how you. Oh, can we see them? Let's see the. I'll show you hot, one. I'll right. show you the hot topics. And you sing. Hot topics. Hot topics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I say to Lisa, I hope we get sued by uh, whoever makes Hot Pockets. Uh, if fun. Jim Gaffigan hasn't been sued, then you will not Right, be sued. that's a great point. Oh, that's true. Um, so Les and I very quickly realized that to do this, we didn't want to need a lot of help from other people. Uh, and your husband. Right. And we didn't want to pay people. So, um, so we were like, look, this has to be really low tech. And Les started making these signs. And I was like, dude, that's it. Like, that's it. That has to be the, you know, the jumping off point for the whole show. So everything we do is low tech. I mean, we don't even have the fancy how you go to other screens to show things. We don't do that. We just talk about it and say, go find this yourself. Um, but and we're sort of, 
Oh, I was just going to say, and we found ourselves on Saturday. Um, we, we, I won't give too much away, but we, um, oh. we decided to record an evening, like the Leslie and Lisa show, the nighttime version with cocktails. And um, oh we all, with our guest, we all took a shot at the top of the show. We all had a cocktail and we shortly realized we hadn't been recording. Well, um, after everything well, shut down, first everything shut down. Then when we came back up, we recorded for another half hour without recording. So it, it was a nice. Because we had too much to drink. It was such a, I don't know if we're allowed to curse here. We're so used to cursing, but it was, it was a mess. It, it was, was a shit show is what yep. you're trying to say. Okay, so that's, ex thank you, That's Louise. what that's Leslie exactly kept calling it. At one point while I was a little um, deeply tipsy, I was like, oh my <laughs> God, this is the Leslie and Lisa shit show. <laughs> we are now going to have to go back because we have basically recorded <laughs> for two hours and the lisa myself and our guest are essentially drunk um but it's going to be hilarious we're going to edit stuff together but generally speaking you know we're we don't edit. we're just gonna go with what happens and yeah <laughs> and that, that and that's so much fun i've also noticed just in reading the descriptions of podcasts that there's an awful lot of drinking that goes on in podcasts and they, they say that, oh, they're just sampling and giving suggestions for wines and beers. And Lisa, I want to talk to you about some of your uh, online pandemic adventures have included sampling whiskey. And so there's also like a really famous show on YouTube called Drunk Cooking or something. I mean, this mm. is something that I guess we find entertaining is that tipsy people attempting to do a thing. Well, I have to say, so when this pandemic first began... I went from drinking maybe one drink a week mm -hmm. to drinking two drinks a night. Mm -hmm. Russ and I were making margaritas nightly. Yeah. Um, it really seemed to be the only way for us to be able to get through without sobbing. Um, and then that went on, I'd say, for about five or six weeks. And then all of a sudden I'd be like, we're going to have margaritas tonight. And then we'd never make them. And then we right. just stopped drinking completely. So, um, when we did this the other night, like now I'll have like, I'm back to old Lisa, which is drinking a glass of wine a couple times a week. But the other night when Leslie and I recorded this show, I like went for it so hard and didn't <laughs> realize what a lightweight I've become. And I will say I was, whether or not it's entertaining, I laughed so hard that <laughs> night and I'm not advocating like, I can laugh really hard sober as well, but I will say this was a very healing evening for me. It was very cathartic. Oh, good. I'd yes. even add that, listen, I'm willing to admit because I, there's very little that is off limits with me. I might have peed in my pants. I did. <laughs> I did. We were laughing so hard and we had been sitting for so long. And at some point I was laughing so hard that I was just like, oops, I just piddled. What are you going to do? Um... <laughs> Change your pants. I yeah. did after the show, but I just, it was, it truly was hilarious. Listen, everybody knows I, unlike Lisa, Lisa's gone back to old Lisa. I've continued to be new Leslie, who is drinking way too much in the pandemic. In fact, prior to sitting down and recording this, I did go out to t uh, Trader Joe's and I made a little pit stop at BevMo to pick up a few things. Nice. Okay, so we're, we're stocked, we're good, we're set. I mean, now, what I want to know is how has doing the show together affected your friendship? I'll take this one, Les. <laughs> Do it. So Leslie and I have been friends for uh, over 30 years. And during that time, we've gone through periods of seeing each other and then years where we hardly see each other, but we never lose touch. No, and Leslie has uh, no less than a hundred incredibly close friends, and I'm not. That is not She's an exaggeration. Super popular. She yeah. really is. Um, and so I kind of feel, for me, like this has been. It's it's a completely new level of our friendship because we're now talking every day, and it's been several months, um, and. 
I'm loving it. I really genuinely feel like we've gotten to know each other and we're getting to know each other on a level that we have never known each other before. But what's super cool is even though we've never spent this much time together, we have a shorthand. Like we're both so brutally honest with each other. There's no like mincing words. She's She'll say something like, I was thinking of doing this. And I'm like, no, we're not doing that <laughs> or vice versa. And, and we don't, it's just, it's been really cool. I never knew she and I would be such great partners. And I, I genuinely think we're great partners. I do, I do too. I do too. It's I reflected do. in the shows. There's a really fun rhythm. It's very engaging and warm. And I think what we're craving is girlfriends. Yeah. I know we just, our girl time, we, we, we're craving it and it's really healing when to hear a conversation like yours and to feel like, oh, this is just- the- and that is essentially, I, I think we probably subconsciously set out to do that, like, because that is our relationship. So this show essentially is, if you could literally just sit back and it's like we're all in a living room together, just chatting yeah, um, and really just being honest with each other. I mean, like Lisa said, we can, you know, she'll say, you should really get on the Peloton and I'll go, okay, well, are we allowed to curse? Sure. Fuck you. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, but it's good. Like, I mean, you know, it's just, it's easy. And I really, truly hope that people like it, we really, truly want to get it to this point where maybe we can have people call in or, you Mm -hmm. know, um, I guess we're going to, one of these, I'm really inept with social media. So, um, Lisa's probably going to get us on like Facebook live or Instagram live or one of those live things so that we can maybe have some other people with us. It would be so much fun. Yeah. And I think it's really, it feels good to bring people entertainment, to bring people something. Because when I'm watching TV and someone sits down at a restaurant and then someone else brings out bread, I say out loud, remember when someone brought you bread? Like we're missing just some of these basic things that were just niceties in the world. It's so funny that you say that, Louise, because Leslie and I were talking about, by the way, Louise, you and I have been friends almost as long as Leslie and I have been friends. But I win, right? Uh, <laughs> I just want to be slightly ahead of Leslie for the for the remainder of this show, and then she can take the lead once again. Okay, you got no, it. No, I'm just teasing it. It's, um, yeah. But Leslie and I had this whole conversation about the thing we miss most about not being able to go out is breakfast, going out for breakfast. Yeah. Because. Yeah, just mm-hmm. having somebody refill your someone coffee. Someone pours your coffee. Yeah. Remember when yep. someone did that? I yeah. do. It's been it, a long time. It's funny. It really, if I can, it, it, if anything, it really is, I miss breakfast out with girlfriends. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I feel and that. Yet, and yet, we've managed to not go out to a restaurant for over nine months. Yeah. Because it's not, not safe. Isn't that fascinating? We miss it so much, but we've managed to not do it because we care about our health and the health of our friends and family. And we're, we're, we now see the light. We're not sure how long this tunnel is, but we know that, yeah. that no one wants to get sick this close to the end zone. Right. So let's just take really good care of each other and do things like go, go for a walk, Zoom people. Yeah. Like I, I joined Zoom meetings, you know, you get an invitation like, oh, do you want to get on Zoom and talk about, you know, you're just like, your first thing is like, no, nah. but then you just, you make yourself do it because I don't know. I think it just, we need, even though it feels really good for me to be solitary because I'm solitary anyway. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, good. I don't have to go to that function that I wasn't going to want to go to anyway. Like a lot of this is really almost too comforting for me. I have to push myself like, no, no, no. You can't just talk to your husband and your siblings and your mom. You ha- you do have to, we have to stay connected to the world. A hundred percent. You know, it's funny. I've told a lot of, I have some friends who obviously, look, we were all tucked away in the beginning and I, I have a handful of friends that I think have been a little too nervous to get out there. Like I have one girlfriend who she was like, God, I miss sushi. And I was like, sweetie, order sushi. I promise you it's going to be okay. Right. You shouldn't be missing out on sushi. It's too good. Mm -hmm. And she just texted me literally a month ago. She's like, oh my God, we ordered in sushi. And I was like, and you're not going to, like, it's, it feels so good. You have to, you have to inch out or me, I ran out. Um, because otherwise you're going to get stuck in a hole and then, 
it's almost like I remember the first time I went out grocery shopping after having been home for a while, I felt like I was living in some weird scientific show. Yeah, movie. it's like a dreamscape. Like, I right. got the kids and my mom at the door and they're like, good luck. Gloves <laughs> <laughs> on and a, and a mask, a mask and a shield. Like I was literally venturing out into the unknown. It, it feels is. like it's, that again, all of a sudden though. I went to all the of a store. Sudden, yeah. yeah. Yesterday there were lines again and, and it's all back to that. And But uh, I don't feel un like, I'm like, I mean, listen, it's not like I want to go, you know, meandering through a grocery store or BevMo right now, but I don't have the fear going in those places like I had before. I know what to do. I know how to conduct myself when I get to the car, right. wash my hands, come home. So mm -hmm. I feel safe, you know? Yeah, we know yeah. the drill. It's not yeah. so unfamiliar you're scary it's still like be careful but we kind of know the drill Absolutely. and we kind of know that it's like the it's aerosolized from our, our speaking breath it's not the things that we touch and as long as you don't touch a thing and touch your face before yep. you get home like we know more about it Absolutely. all right i have an update from fritz would you like to hear from yes. yes all right this is from the front lines still troubleshooting they think i have a bad modem mm. all right so now i want to ask you guys you can cry a little bit. I'm having about a diseased crazy. heart. Anyways, go ahead. Right. <laughs> um, let's see. Where did I leave off in my rundown? How's your... Uh, Lisa, yes. this one's for you. Okay. You have appeared in both Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Can yes. you talk about the differences in the process? <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, yes. I'm laughing for uh, reasons that I'm just uh, thinking about whether or not to share. Um, so, so, well, first of all, Seinfeld... Uh, is very scripted, was very scripted. Uh, you know, there's no deviation from that. Um, and it was also my first real acting job. So it was the most horrifyingly intimidating, nauseating experience ever. No, because you and I started doing stand up together, and I can personally attest that Lisa had to throw up before every stand every stand so i can imagine that in front of a live audience it was a similar your body reacted no in a... it's not about it because there was no audience it wasn't about oh. it being a live audience they okay. did very little they only shot a, a couple scenes per episode in front of a live audience and his stand-up you know that he would do at the beginning and the end that was in front of a live audience of extras oh everything else was not live however when your scene is making out with Michael Richards and he's a total dick yeah, and yells at you in the middle of a scene and it's your first job ever, um, it was awful. Now, thank God the director, Andy Ackerman, was so lovely and, and didn't yell back at Michael Richards, but, but said to him, she's doing exactly how, uh, what I directed her to do. Um, so anyway, that was, that was a wonderful experience and amazing. And, and I couldn't believe I booked it and all that, but it was very hard cut to over a decade later. Um, I'm doing my first episode of curb your enthusiasm. And it was the most magical experience I had ever had in this business. And so have the subsequent three that I've done been. That's um, amazing. And done? that's all improvised. Sorry, Leslie, what? I said that you'd done been that I dumb bin. Um, but it's, uh, it's all improvised that you have a, you have a thing that you have to achieve in the scene. But other than that, you're just playing. It's genuinely the equivalent of being on a playground when you're a kid and somebody saying, here's bubbles and a slide and there's water guns and a merry-go-round and the ice cream truck is there. You can have anything you want. Go. With other really creative that, kids. Yeah. yeah. Which, which, by the way, kudos to you, Lise, because that, at least to me, would be incredibly intimidating, have to, having to improv with one of the comic geniuses in our lifetime. I mean- Well, there's a trick to it. Which you is- You have to not give a shit if you mess yeah. up, because the, the whole thing about being on that set is Larry is rooting for you. He wants you to be funnier than you've ever been. Like he's literally rooting for you. So if you do something he's not thrilled with, he'll say, don't do that again. And you have to know he's not mad at you. He just wants you to be better. 
So then when you do it again, you do it better. And if you can, if you can let go and say, I know I can do this. I know I, he hired me because I can do this. Then it is an absolute playground. So are there a lot of performers that have been on both shows? It's funny. There's a, an Instagram, um, account called, I think it's Curb Clips, and they recently posted all of the actors who have been on both, but I wasn't in there, and I wanted to go, you guys forgot me, and then I realized, uh, how dare they, Um, but there were like 12. That's not very many, so no. When you consider all of the guest performances on both shows, that is not very many. I mean, look, maybe there's more. We can't we can't guarantee that curb clips knows exactly what they were talking about. Cause they missed me, but, um, mm-hmm. but look at him. And by the way, big scoop, Larry David that. is sexy as hell. Mm-hmm. Agreed. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And it, like, and I don't think you are either uh, Louise, but no, he, I'm I, not. no, he is like, you meet him and you're like, Oh yeah, he's the, he's so cool. And so doesn't care about what anybody else thinks of him that you're kind of like, yeah, you're hot. He should start a cult because we'd both be so in. (laughs) Well, I would be in the LD cult. (laughs) So now I have a question for you, Leslie, in case you were about to relax. Don't. (laughs) Leslie, you have so many credits and everyone has seen you somewhere. So they must each have different engagements with you when they recognize you and approach you. I, for example, was obsessed with Ed. But what do you usually get from people and what do they want to talk to you about? Well, today, uh, it really is um, like almost on a daily basis, except for now with quarantine. Um, I get people who look at me and go, "Uh, do I know you? And I go, no. And they're like, no, 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 no. Did we we go to high school together? (laughs) And so I always go, well, did you grow up in LA? No. I'm like, no. So it, it, it frustrates everybody around me. It frustrates my mother. Um, why can't you just tell these people you're an actress? I'm like, because I can't. Because it, it almost sounds obnoxious coming out of my mouth. Like, well, do you know me from... Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do as a group. Okay. The three of us, we're going to find, because I'm really good at crafting um, messaging and language and, you know, it concisely and in a way that's very humble. So, so Lisa, mm-hmm. we have to come up with the right way for her to say, like, you've probably seen me on TV without it sounding what yeah, I just said. Because that's exactly, uh, well, so it, it was one experience I had. I happened to be in Berkeley, California, and it was during Ed, I even think. Um, and some gentleman at a pizza place was like, hey, I know you. And I'm like, oh, I don't even know what to say to it. And yeah. he goes, I, um, do you, I don't know. Do you work here? No. Do you live there? No. Do you do this? No. I mean, a million questions. He wouldn't stop. So I finally was like, I'm an actor. It's probably that. No. <laughs> Where do I know you from? So but I'm see, like, oh my God, hilarious. I have to see my resume. So I start saying things. Ed, no. Um, babes, no. Uh, I mean, like, and I'm like, I give up, dude. We don't know each other. It, uh, you know? Well, here's what I think you should do. And Lisa, you can... I'll Maybe weigh in after. Help me amend this messaging. But I think that you should say, well, I'm an actor and I, it'll probably pop into your head in the car on the, uh, you know, when you're driving home, it will probably pop, pop into your head. Or the next time you see that show, you'll be like, oh, that's who that was. But just saying I'm an actor, I think is at least gives people a chance to catch up later with their brain. Right. Yeah, it's true. Because my mother's always like, it's so rude of you not to say something because that's exactly what it is. And I, I, it really, truly is because I find myself, maybe Lisa will disagree, humble. Like, I don't want to just be like, oh, it's because I'm an actress. But yeah. that's not not humble. That's your job. Mm-hmm. You're like, right. So, so I could say, oh, you know me from, you know, I work at that butcher down the street. You Exactly. You're right. Russ came up with a really smart thing for me. Okay. Where when somebody says, why do I know you? He assesses their age. <laughs> and then we'll, like, he knows if they're in their late, 20s they know me from um nickelodeon or disney um because i was on shows when 10 years ago uh you know if they're in their mid-20s uh they know me from Corey in the house if they're um you know 
if they're a guy who's around 40, he knows me from Windy City Heat, which is a movie I did that Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla produced. Like there, I now can gauge people's ages and almost always tell them exactly why they know me. And it is, it makes them go, oh yes, thank you. Right, because it's like, you're already in their brain by right. virtue of them having watched you. So I think it's okay to like help them get there, even if they just completely want to disagree with you. And Let then maybe them... Leslie, don't do that um, that voice you do when you say you're an actress. Like if you don't do that, oh, I'm an actress, then, then yeah. maybe yeah, well, because that's exactly what I Right, do. and that's the problem. Just go, oh, I'm an actress. I'll work on it with you later. Okay, so what I want to know is, um, are you guys noticing that people are finding different pieces of your work since streaming became more of a thing and also since we're all home watching TV? I mean, I have the problem is I haven't really run into anybody anywhere. Right. And they... I wear a mask, so nobody knows who I am. Right, although I recognize Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits under his mask at the grocery store oh, in Santa Barbara. that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Listen, I will say I've seen a few people with the mask on and I go, hey, and I do know who they are. They're not people, they're friends of mine, but not good friends. I don't see them very often, but right. it's amazing who you can sort of recognize. recognize under a mask. By the way, that's a fun drinking game, trying <laughs> to figure out who all the celebrities are under their masks. <laughs> I think that that should be a Tumblr or probably is already several Tumblrs. Oh, I love that. Celebrities and masks. That's funny. At Tumblr.com. If it's not, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'm totally in. After we joined the cult with Larry David. Exactly. We're, we're going to be very busy. <laughs> <laughs> so how are both of you consuming uh, content along your media paths during this pandemic? Like, what have you guys been enjoying? So I just started listening to audible books because and i have 20 something in my library um but uh my birthday just passed and my husband got me airpods Ooh. so now i listen when i'm cleaning or cooking and that's been super cool um it's really fun but when my husband is cooking wearing the airpods which i call air buds because that's just I what, always I, do that what too. I do. But like when i say when i say like what time is dinner he starts screaming because when, nice. <laughs> when you're wearing those, you just don't have any w way to regulate the sound of your own voice. And I you do just this start whenever screaming. anybody talks to me when my AirPods are in. <sighs> Hold on. I have to pause what I'm listening to. I'm sorry, uh, what? That's usually... How well, dare I, someone from I, your actual I, physical space attempt to communicate with correct. you? Correct. <laughs> and I, I guess because so I'm single and I have two kids in the house. So I, if I'm going to listen to something... I only put one, by the way, I call them earbuds or air earbuds or yeah. earpods. Sure. I only put one in. Because okay. I can hear. Mm. And by the way, I I feel like you can you can hear, by the way, just as well on one as you do too. But I don't want to. I want to block everyone out. Yeah, I, can, <laughs> uh, I guess I could, but I don't. Right. Um, I don't listen. I'm not consuming anything audibly as much as I am like. I'm finding myself late at night. I did this with the undoing. I was up two nights in a row till three o'clock in the morning, finishing the undoing. Um, and I also binged uh, the Queen's Gambit in like maybe one night. Okay, we'll have to cut. You'll come back and we'll talk about the Queen's Gambit because we only just finished episode I'll two. I'll try to watch it before. I'm you just going to say that. this. It's not giving anything away, but I don't know about you, Louise. I find her mesmerizing. Absolutely. At every age. Oh my God, I am just yeah. taking with her. I Completely. can't wait. Yeah, <sighs> it's really fun. And I'm going to recommend a program that t was told to us on our podcast by Wendy Liebman and Jeffrey Sherman. And it's on the Acorn. I don't know how you find the Acorn if you don't, if you're not willing to subscribe to it, but we're watching it on the Acorn, which is like British streaming. And so everything is just better. And we all know that the best American actors are Australian anyway. So you just <laughs> go right to the source British here. This show is called A Place to Call Home and it's Australian and it's like sweeping the globe and people are calling it sort of a modern Downton Abbey. So 
the costumes and the cars. And it's like a manor house in Australia. And it's right after World War II. So there's people that have just been recently traumatized by the war, by the Holocaust, by prisoner of war camps, and they're just getting on with their fancy lives. And then you also see kind of the, the kind of regular town folk who are a part of the plot. And it's just, I was just now that it's over, I just keep saying to my husband, I miss those people because, you you know, you get to spend time with them and then it's over and they move on. And now you're obsessively watching interviews on YouTube with the actors. No, right? you know what you should move on to hmm. is the Great British Baking Show season eight. Ooh. So is that like, uh, is it a, a contest or is it? It <sighs> is. Okay. okay. But you're obsessed. It, okay. Yeah. It Yes. I can't even explain to you what this show has meant to me. <laughs> okay. I, and I'm not kidding. In terms of getting me through my hardest times, it is like a warm hug from your grandma who lets you rest your head on her bosom while she force feeds you chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> how, how, long, how long have you been watching... Um, this. Five years. Oh, you have been watching it for five Yes. Years. I didn't know if you had just started binging it because I've watched it and then watched the American version, which... Oh, the American version. People, the American... <sighs> we, we really kind of... We really... Gosh, we... It's do. the worst. Yeah. No, no, I have news from the front. I have news from the front. Okay. I watched. So this, this just in. Brits. Um, I have to go to Van Nuys and get a new modem from Spectrum. <sighs> Why can't Fritz. they bring him one? I, I do not know, Leslie. I do not know. Fritz is he, really missing out. He probably needs a modem now because he's probably hosting some exactly. sort of charity yeah. Zoom benefit and tonight. They so can't come out for a few yeah, minutes, that's why. He's so, going. but we're going to bring Dina into the conversation because when Dina saw that you guys were going to be on, she was like, <gasps> she got super excited. She fangirled for just a uh -huh. half of a second, and then Leslie, when she looked up your your bio, she had like a mini stroke. So Ouch. Dina, no, she's okay. Oh, very, 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 very many. Dina, are you well, there? I'd love to hear that anybody could have a stroke over me. Yeah, no, she, I'm here. I'm yeah. here. And All my, right, so tell my us, cardiac health is still intact. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us why you got so excited when you saw Le Leslie's IMDb. Well, the reason that I got so excited is because I saw that Leslie was in the very early 90s on a show called Parker Lewis can't lose. And I'm like one of those like insufferable millennials. I'm an older millennial, but still who's like obsessed with nostalgia. I just like, I love it so hard and I can't like, I can't help it all. Um, I actually, during the, the early part of the pandemic, I like went back and started watching some of those shows, including Parker Lewis cameras. So you can I find everything now, right? You just yeah. anyone who's... Um, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember now. It was because I have a Roku and there was one channel. There's some channel, I want to say uh, Philo, like P-H-I-L-O. Oh, God, I'm not going to remember it. But there was one channel that showed... Um, that was showing all the episodes and it was, I believe it's free with ads because they show ads. So you can mm, watch it for okay. free. Fun. Um, so you can really just kind of revisit all these things that meant a lot to you as a child. Yeah. And like, um, and you know, when you're like 10 years old and you have like a huge crush on corn, that make like that never really goes away. <laughs> sure. But yeah, like I'm one of those like horrible people who like I'll watch these old shows and then like I log on to Etsy and I see like, what cross stitch someone did in honor of like blossom or something like that and like Truth. So that, that's my media path sure no I absolutely it. i do like crazy things like i'll look up like the lyrics to paul simon songs because i can't quite understand him he's singing <laughs> too quickly and like i just so i'm so thrilled with everything that you anytime a thought crosses your mind like huh well, here I go, you know. I mean, it's It really, you know, listen, my mom is always talking about, you know, the downfall of technology, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, but there are so many positive things, right? Because that's exactly yeah. anything you think of. You're like, oh, I'll just go look it up. Yeah. You can literally look up anybody. I remember I met with, um, I was asked to do a play in New York City written by um, Neil LeBute. 
and um, I'd never met Neil. So he was in LA, I was in LA. And so we met up at uh, Hugo's in the city. And I walked in, I know who I knew who I was looking for, but still I walked in, he was like, hey, he, like he immediately recognized me. And I was so surprised. He was like, oh, I Googled you. Um, because that's what you, you could just Google anybody. And this right. was a good, this was probably almost 20 years ago, by the way. Um, so it, it, you know, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm. I want to hear about Parker Lewis can't lose and who you played and all and where is Corin Nemec and is he available to have like maybe just like a quick afternoon yeah. coffee with Dina? <laughs> you know, I have no idea where Corin Nemec was. Um, that so when did I do that show? I'm gonna say like ninety three ish, something like that. When it was play. right around there. It was somewhere around there because it was after I had done Babes and that was in the, that was in 90. Um, I had so much fun on that show. Plus I was probably older than everybody because at that point I was still in my mid twenties playing. I was a teenager. So um, um, sorry to interrupt. So it was 1991, according to Wikipedia. Oh, yes? So okay. if that's correct. So right, did Parker old. Lewis ever lose? <laughs> Parker Lewis, by the way, never lost. He can't. Mm -hmm. You, you, you can't. couldn't. It's in the um, title. But it was very sweet because especially back then, um, I will say that all of my early roles in this business um, probably all had something to do with weight. I was usually the chubby girl on in whatever I was playing. Um, I, I sort of I've cornered the mar I cornered the market on chubby girl. And uh, so I think I played I played a girl who uh, did I did I end up going to the dance or the prom or something with um, Leslie? I have tell me what two, I did. I have two words for you. Yeah, teen queen. Teen queen. Does that ring any bells? Yes, but I was the chubby girl, right? That was sort of right. That was like the plot line. Is that, that plot. Um, Parker Lewis, who is of course like an early like technology adopter, of course. Mm. Yeah. Um, was wasn't, like, wasn't, I think Parker Lewis was actually fashioned after, uh, the Matthew Broderick movie. Ferris yes, Bueller. Ferris, yeah. Thus that's his winning what, record. That's what we all, uh, yeah, we've all come oh. to that conclusion. Um, so he was like chatting with your character, like online or something, like some early version of the internet or like chat room. And then he was like surprised that like, I was because I was so funny and I was so charming and he really liked me and then we met up at school and it was like oh god oh no she's overweight yeah oh I mean it's like it's crazy to think about now that that was like the plot line of of the show but that's kind of what is like fascinating to me like that's why I always keep going back and why I have like these strong like the strong pull towards nostalgia because it's so different and so specific, especially with a show like that, where like his parents like owned this video store. Like it was so like of that moment, mm -hmm. really kind of are just like pulled into that time period. And you just really kind of like, you feel it, like you kind of feel it in your veins because it's so specific. Right. And it's, it's for you upon first viewing, you were in the middle of forming self. So that's a yeah. part of what formed around right, it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So while we're talking about Googling, I think it's a fun question to ask. And this may not apply to Dina, who probably was got to Google when she was like three or four, but for- well, I'm not that young. <laughs> for those of us who were already grown up when the internet came over, what is the first, after you got your, you know, you know, oh. connection, <laughs> what- was the first thing you googled oh my god i yahoo. remember the Maybe first thing i yahooed it. okay the first yeah. thing i yahooed was the um the six the kevin bacon website six oh. degrees of yeah. kevin bacon that's okay. what i went on yahoo and i searched for that and i played with that oh, no. i can barely remember what i ate for breakfast yesterday so <laughs> i, I have to say I probably, I, I know I Googled a lot of song lyrics because there's mm. a lot of songs you don't know the lyrics. You're like, have, what are... Do you, you ever, um, I'm trying to think of, can you tell that my brain is like, the little rat in my brain's like on the wheel going, going, and then... And then stops, and line then two. Go, 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 go. Um, I thought it was just your Zoom hookup. Yeah, <laughs> no, there's no in my brain. It's definitely um, fritzing. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, no pun intended. Yeah, well, at least we have something. <laughs> at least we have a little Fritz on That's the, show. the most Fritz we got. <laughs> anyway, so maybe music lyrics, I don't know, or or casts of, sh uh, no, I wouldn't look up a cast. Probably either music lyrics or looking up like a celebrity and trying to find out information on them. Or one more thing. Um, I know back then I was interested to see if, if I put in my name or if I put in my address, if information would come. Yes. Yes. Because, you know, you were always afraid to, you know, get like fan mail. I still get fan mail to my house. Like you, eventually you throw your hands up and you give up. Everybody can find you now. There's no hiding anymore, but maybe that. Thus the moat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's that is exactly the same here, Leslie. Now that you say that, that absolutely sparked um, a memory of me doing that. I don't know if it was the first thing, but for sure I did that because I was wickedly famous at that point. Yeah, you were. Well, it is. You know, I was it, an actress. <laughs> it is interesting to have a <laughs> a public facing life and then still want a private part of it. And that's, that's why like Leslie and I both have tried to never get too successful because we really <laughs> want to keep our private lives private. And yeah. that we always had to be like, no, I right. am so, it's so lovely that you want me to star in. Um... Well, like when they offered you fences and you turned it down, but they still gave you the credit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a question for people who are famous. Are selfies more or less troublesome than autographs? I've never had anyone ask to take a picture with me, only autographs. And even that has been so unbelievably rare. I have asked certain celebrities to take pictures with me because of shows that Garrett and I watch together. So it's usually at an audition and I'll be like, oh my God, I saw the girl and I can't think of her name right now. Oh golly. I'll think of it in a second, but- Rat stop. Um, huh? The rat stopped. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, she's on, she plays the reporter on Parks and Rec and we were at an audition together. And I actually, now that I'm thinking of it, did not ask to take a picture of her, but I just, I watched her. Like we were both waiting for the audition the whole time. And then she went in before me and on her way out, I was like, I just have to tell you, I think you're so great on Parks and Rec. And my son and I watch every episode, we're obsessed. And she was so sweet and uh, told me a couple stories, but I don't, I, how, Leslie, has that happened to you? Um... No, I mean, maybe a few selfies, not, I mean, autographs haven't happened since like the early 2000s. I yeah, seen. I think that selfies have replaced autographs. And that's I'm just right. wondering if people find that more intrusive. Or, I would think that's more intrusive. But it's like easier yeah. than writing and finding a pen and the whole thing. Yeah, but if somebody mm -hmm. takes a picture with you, there, there's no... With it. Yeah, there's nothing stopping them from posting it on every single... I went through this period, Leslie, I don't know if this happened to you. I went through a period for a couple years where people would send me pictures of myself yeah, and I... ask me to sign them and send them back to them. I just got like two of them from, I don't know, I want to say either came from Norway or Finland or somewhere in, in Europe. I, I got this huge package of all these Agent Carter pictures. Wow. Sign and send back. Yeah. Do you think they're the, do you worry that they're just gonna sell them? They are, oh, that's all they're that's doing. They're do. So and what do you- I mean, If they wanna make a dollar fifty on a picture of me from Agent Carter, by all means, go ahead. It, you're not gonna get much, but- All right, well, what's coming up? What can we look forward to on the Leslie and Lisa show? Well, we just post- version. What? <laughs> The nighttime drunk version. The nighttime drunk version with a pretty big guest who will be airing. That, that will post sometime uh, just after the new year. Matt Eisman is up there now. We have... Um, we have Phil Lamar. Phil Lamar is coming up, I think, next week. Um, Ralph Garman uh, has already posted, who is a phenomenal talent. Um, but we, what we're doing is a little less uh, live than you, Louise. We're sort of trying to bank some shows so that we can, you know, uh, it, post once a week. Um, and the thing that we're really trying to do is have some big celebrities, which we are accomplishing, but also in between other people that work in the industry, like makeup artists, um, you know, theater awesome. managers, that kind of stuff. And then also um, 
emergency room doctors, sex therapists, gynecologists, like we're trying to just have it be interesting, just people we would want to talk to at a mm-hmm. dinner party. Oh, yeah, really trying funny. to run the gamut. It's, it's funny. It sounds weird when I say we're going to have famous people and real people. I don't want to say that because everybody in the end, everybody's, you know, we're all the same. We're all human beings. But but we are. We'll ha- we happen to have some famous friends, but we really do want to talk to, you know, just everyday people and what they're experiencing, whether in this quarantine situation or otherwise. We have a friend from high school that owns a great restaurant in Encino. We want to have her on. Um, Like Lisa said, a sex therapist because couldn't think of anything more interesting than that. And then to couple that, and then a gynecologist. Like who as a female doesn't, we can't wait to have the gynecologist on. I have so many questions. I really do. Like, and, and as it says, I, as we always say at the top of the show, at least for me, there is very little, if anything, that is off limits with me. There should be, I should keep my mouth shut a little bit more and probably not talk about the things I talk about, but whatever, that's just who I am. We All right. You so people are um, like, you want to put forward like the most authentic product that you can just like be the real the real Lisa and the real Leslie. That's a hundred percent it. Yeah. Which and is like you're Angelinos. And did you guys both um, grow up in, in Los Angeles? We both like grew up in the, and we both grew up in the San Fernando Valley. We're Valley girls. We're totally we're, Valley girls. We're eight one eighters. <laughs> I'm and like in a, I adopted the Valley, but yeah. Like, so the thing is, is when you live, when you're an Angelino, like that's your life is, half like famous people and half real people. Like that's just your experience is like, you know, and a famous person is like, not like, not someone that's, you know, intimidating or like inaccessible well, no, to you. Because the, one of the reasons we know well, you're so also many in people, the industry. right. One of the, re- one of the reasons we know so many people's were in the industry, but also yeah. because we have kids. So mm-hmm. our kids have to go to preschools and other places exactly. with other people who just happen to be, uh- I, celebrities right exactly right i have to say when i when i write down all the people that we're gonna approach to talk to a good portion of those people that are famous or successful in this business um are the people that my kids have mm. that i've met through my kids through school because wow. it's in la yeah, yeah it's, it's just part of your life part yeah. of the neighborhood like totally integrated yeah well i want everyone to go to your channel and subscribe and leave comments and like buttons the thumbs up is really fun to press yes and um i'm now gonna read my closing credits are you ready yes okay here they come we would love for you to join us online on instagram and twitter where we are at media path pod and on facebook where we are media path podcast you can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcasts. We would love to know what media you've been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. And I would like to thank our guests, Leslie Boone and Lisa Arch. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Demanda, John Maddox, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Alex Gilroy, and you. I'm Louise Palanker. Fritz Coleman is picking up a new modem down at Spectrum. And we will see you along the media path.